I'm not sure how I ended up with the uh, enviable duty of introducing two sports legends back to back, uh, but I'll take it, so here I am again. Livestrong truly demonstrates what a well-known and widely respected individual can do when he is determined and really to really make a difference. The movement of the yellow wristband created the kind of global community around an issue that all who aspire to do social good marvel at and strive to emulate, a seemingly simple idea that resonates with the world. To discuss the phenomena that is Livestrong, please welcome its founder, Lance Armstrong, its CEO and president, Doug Ullman, and Mashable's brand new editor-in-chief, Lance Ulanoff. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, guys, thrilled to be here. Uh, we're actually going to kick this off with a, uh, an important uh, little video. So let's uh, take a look at that and then we'll chat. Nike approached us in early 2004 with an idea to make a yellow wristband. We want to take a silicone wristband and we want to make them yellow and put Livestrong on there uh, and we want to sell them all for a dollar. I remember us sitting around kind of rolling our eyes at the idea and saying, okay, great. Yeah, that'll, that'll, really, that'll really hit the charts. It became a mission for myself and a few other people at Nike, and, and it really bubbled up from a grassroots standpoint. And it just resonated, and it started to become this organic movement. Athletes were wearing them there on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and pretty soon, you know, walking around the community, started to see them on everybody. We couldn't have paid for that level of visibility. And at the same time, no one was telling you to wear it. It was sort of like, hey, if this resonates with you, put it on. And so it, when Lance retired, we had this grassroots group of people who had all stood up and said, you know, I'm going to wear this wristband. I want to be a part of it. People wanted to run, walk, ride, whatever they could do to support this movement. We had people willing to go out and work for us to get the word out, to spread the message, to be an army of volunteers. I'm running for the Lance Armstrong Foundation in remembrance of my cousin. I lost my brother in April, and I just want to get his fight out there. I can walk, I can talk, I can be a voice. We're really bringing people together that truly care and truly want to make a difference. Is the fight against cancer a national priority under your presidency? Yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Our recovery plan will launch a new effort to conquer a disease that has touched the life of nearly every American. Cancer is global in scope and yet different from place to place. It needs a global response and Lance Armstrong and his foundation are the right people to do it. Well the goal is to obviously take the message of Live Strong around the world. We've been pretty much all over the world. We've talked with world leaders, top NGOs, and then we have individuals who are just passionate about the cause. Our commitment to fighting cancer is to help raise awareness and raise funds. Make sure that tobacco, which is a major cause of cancer, is controlled in Nigeria. I believe in our commitment towards the breast cancer cause. My commitment is to carry on with what I'm doing till the day I die. Unless, of course, we manage to defeat cancer in the meantime, and I'll happily retire. It's incredible the impact we've had on but there's so much more to do. We can have a world without cancer. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. But this is the beginning of that movement. We've realized tremendous commitments and tremendous success and this is not the end point. It's actually just the beginning. Great video. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, Officially, uh, welcome you two guys to the stage, uh, Doug and Lance. Uh, easy name for me you to can, remember. Yeah, you can, I can remember it, your name, too. It, it's kind of surprising we haven't met uh, after all these years. You know, all Lances are part of the same club, so it's a shame. But, but we've, we've solved that The now. Lance Club. <laughs> Lance. Oh, <laughs> just keep saying it. So, um, you know, the focus here, you know, I keep thinking about the wristbands. I'm wearing one. You guys gave me one. I'm very happy about that. And uh, it's a physical object analog, and the big challenge, the big challenge for you guys now, going
going forward is, is the transition to the digital, to keep, to keep the momentum going. And, and either one of you, I'm just curious, how, how do you do that? Where do you begin? Go ahead, Lance. It's, uh, it's, okay. it's difficult, especially when you, you couple, uh, obviously, the success of the wristband, which, uh, the, as the video showed, we thought was, in a lot of ways, was just going to be a, uh, <clears throat> almost a joke. I mean, we were going to be stuck with, they gave us $5 million to start with. We thought, we're gonna, what the hell are we going to do with $4.8 <laughs> million of these things? <laughs> Wrap the newspaper, shoot them at each other, I don't know, but <laughs> napkins. Um, and so then you also couple that with, I mean, the, the idea around it, or when it, when it started was in celebration of, uh, of, two, of when to, in 2004, I was trying to win the Tour de France for the sixth time. So Nike said, we'll give you $5 million plus a million dollar gift. If you, if you sell them all, you'll get $6 million. You'll win the Tour de France the sixth time. So you couple it with these sporting things, it gets this global audience as well. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to, uh, to duplicate that. I mean, I can't right. go out, obviously my, my time of winning the Tour is over, and I can do other things uh, from a sporting perspective. I can run the New York City Marathon. I could do the Ironman. I could do a lot of things that might grab people's attention, but nothing will ever get close to winning seven tours. But okay, so 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 Lance is saying he's not helping. Doug, <laughs> Doug, I'd like to know well, I'm, what I'm are done. you I'm doing? What so, are you so, doing? So so I'd say a few things about the wristband, and I've whoa, I've said I've said this before, but first and foremost, the yellow band democratized philanthropy. It gave people a way to participate in something for a dollar. <clears throat> and philanthropy used to be something you did when you had time, when you had resources, and when you were older. And this allowed everyone to get involved at a very grassroots level. It also destigmatized the disease that we fight. It allowed people to outwardly and publicly show their support and virtually tell their story. And I think the translation or transition from this object to social media is now people have taken the wristband and they're using social media to tell their story in a bigger way. And there's nothing that can be more powerful because it encourages other people to get screened, it encourages other people to talk about this disease that for so long has been hushed. And uh, I think when we look back in another decade, we're gonna say, wow, that really changed the conversation and started uh, the movement. Now, I know combined, you guys have about four million uh, Twitter followers. Uh, Lance, how are you now leveraging uh, the people who are paying attention to you digitally, socially, uh, to sort of, to, to share that message? Um, well, you, I mean, I tell a, a few different messages. I, th I mean, I think the, the key thing with any Twitter account, and especially mine, is that it's just, is that people understand it's authentic. You're not selling them something. You're not forcing something on them. Perhaps sometimes, uh, I mean, I do tweet a lot about Livestrong and the work we're doing the, this week here in, in New York City and all the UN work and all the stuff we're doing. Obviously, that we put out there. But even if, if we were having an event in, in Seattle tomorrow and we needed 50 volunteers, I, I guarantee you I could get the 50 volunteers. You just put it out there and say, hey, please come out and help, and, and people respond amazingly. But then also for me, I still tweet about you know, messing around with my kids or well, the training say, I'm fewer, doing. I was going to say, fewer shots of your meals, and also you should eat more. I mean, I'm seeing very small meals, so <laughs> yeah. if you could do that. Uh, Doug, when, you, when, when you're crafting that message, on online digitally, how does it have to change though? Like you know, because you've got a very this is so specific. This yellow wristband. Mm -hmm. What what nuances of the online digital world do you need to to leverage to get the message out there correctly? You know, I think for us, the movement has become uh, has grown so organically and has become so significant that the challenge now is how to use these social media tools to segment the audience. Um, obviously, it's great that people are self-selecting to be a part of, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or, or any other tool, um, but how do you really tailor messages for a specific audience, whether it's an event in Seattle, whether it's something here in New York at the UN, um, or whether it's a grassroots public policy campaign to increase tobacco tax, um, which, which is something we're working on right now. Um, so that's been a challenge, but, but we've, we've, we're learning as we go, and we don't profess to be experts uh, by any means, but I think Lance said it best, which is it has to be authentic. And it has to, uh, the other Lance, actually. Uh, I was going to say, um, I was, but, uh, I was doing pretty good. <laughs> but I think it just has to be truly uh, authentic in everything that we do. Do you, do you ever find, Lance, that uh, the message gets uh, changed, you know, because it goes on to social media and, you know, game of telephone happens there? How are you guys able to sort of put the bumpers and keep it on message? Well, obviously, <clears throat> you're a little bit uh, restricted with Twitter because you don't have a lot of space there. <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's... I don't have a lot to say anyway, so it's better for me to give me 140 characters works good for 
Well, what about Facebook? Made. I mean, how do, you, how do you guys Facebook and, you know, we could talk about Google Plus since I know everybody's signing up right now, but, uh, but Facebook, which has, you know, build, you know hundreds yeah. and of I, millions and I'm of not, people. And I have to confess, I'm not a, uh, a, a Facebooker. <laughs> well, Doug, do you... Do you I have know? a fan page, but I don't have a So a the foundation page. uses Facebook in pretty significant ways, and, and it's now become really the number one source for people who are newly diagnosed with cancer and how they reach out to us. So we get much more traffic through Facebook than we do through our, our foundation website. And the team that manages Brooke and, and Heidi and Jeff and others that manage our Facebook page um, have become really adept at, at, at those one-on-one -on -one conversations and directing people to the resources they need in a time of, of real crisis. Um, but I also think that we're trying to work with companies like Facebook to improve the experience. Mm. Um, there's so much that, that those tools could do for nonprofits and social uh, entrepreneurship organizations um, that it, it just isn't currently designed to do. And so we're trying to encourage them to sort of add some functionality uh, that will allow us to further our mission in, in a better way. Now, Lance, I know that you're very focused on uh, some of the laws like out in California, trying to help them put an additional tax on smoking to help with cancer research. Uh, and it's interesting, California, Hollywood, uh, you know, middle of the 20th century, a lot of time was spent showing people how cool smoking mm -hmm. is. How does modern digital media, how, how is it changing, helping to change that message, or is it? Well, I, th I, I mean, I, two things are happening. One, people are smoking less and less, which is good. Um, <clears throat> this will be a tough initiative that we'll try to, to, to get done in, in California. We had a, a similar situation in Texas a few years ago. Uh, with an initiative called Proposition 15, and we, we literally used, I mean, talking about using the power of, of this army that the, the wristband had built up, there was one particular um, <laughs> legislator who was absolutely opposed to this and in a position to block it. This is a $3 billion initiative in cancer research just in the state of Texas. So by the sale of the wristbands and by accumulating all these names in our database, especially the people from Texas, we, we sent out an email to all the Texans and said, here's their name, here's their phone number, and here's their email address. Just let them know that you are in support of Proposition 15. At the end of the day, the assistant called back and said, okay, please have your people stop calling. <laughs> we will support this. And so that literally, that, that was the tipping point from, from zero over 10, over 10 years to $3 billion over 10 years. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. So uh, you kind of answered a question I was going to ask you, which I think you did at least, um, uh, which is more effective in the war against cancer, uh, social media or public policy? Uh, it sounds like public policy, when leveraged yeah. in the right way, can they're, make they're a big difference. They're both difference. important. I mean, now it's, it's obviously it, 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 we're at a, a difficult time, and not just our country, but all around the world. So funding is, is, is certainly not increasing. It's not staying, uh, it's not even staying level when, when compared to inflation. So. All of the people, all of the smart people in the room at the NIH or the NCI or HHS uh, are, are needing funds and needing resources to continue this fight, and, and they're simply not there right now. I think the key is that social media allows us to be more effective in the public policy arena for such a, a, a small cost. Yeah. I mean, no, there's no more you know, stuffing envelopes and doing these mass mailings and phone banks and things like that. And as long as we can continue to refine the tools and target people, then we can have a huge impact on public policy using these, these free tools, which have revolutionized the nonprofit space. So we should make a little news here. I'll try. So uh, first I'll ask you, should Lance Armstrong run for Texas governor? <clears throat> I, I, I will answer so that. So I'll answer, I'll answer that. No. 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 He, he, he no. shouldn't. Um, Maybe the other Lance on the stage can run. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely no. not. Here's the problem, and the problem with that is that, I mean, this, the, the issue that we deal with on a daily basis is apolitical. It's not a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. Uh, this disease doesn't care if you're an R or D or if you're rich or you're poor, if you speak English or Spanish or French. It doesn't care. So as soon as I were to even uh, make any type of an association there, we would perhaps, and certainly if I ran, we would alienate half of our constituency right there. And so we're not in a position to do that. We don't want to do that. We feel like this is a, uh, this is a disease that strikes everybody. And um, I, I mean, uh, look, politics is a mess. What are you <laughs> going to get done in politics? I mean, I can get, I and this team that we have in Austin can get a lot more done outside of politics than we would in. So uh, you once said that uh, your job is to suffer. Um, and that was during the time that you were, you were racing. So, so what do you consider your job now? 
I still suffer. <laughs> <laughs> is that because of Doug? Doug, are you pushing him too hard? No, no Doug and I run every now and again, and I can, trust me, he's not the one suffering. <laughs> but I still, no, I still, I mean, the, the suffer part was more about the training and enjoying the process of, of training for something or trying to peak for something, and, and that inevitably uh, means a lot of suffering. Okay, so we have, uh, we have like a 90-second video that we're going to take a look at, and then we're going to have some time for uh, questions. So why don't we take a look at that video? Do you have uh, questions from somewhere? I thought there was, for some reason, I thought someone was going to give me cards to read questions off of. Is that not true? <laughs> Is that not true? Well, we're, you know Hold what? That's fine. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It, are there any questions from the, out in the off, audience right there? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a father of three girls, so I, <clears throat> I uh, plenty of women in my life, but um, the thing I always talk about is, uh, this, we, we talk about stigma a lot, and certainly I, there was a lot of stigma being a 25-year-old kid in Texas diagnosed with testicular cancer. Trust me, nobody, you weren't running out and screaming that to everybody um, back in the mid-90s, but about 10 or 15 years before that, the breast cancer movement came along and, and really changed all of that for, for guys. And they were brave enough to go out and say, no, 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 we're not going to be afraid or ashamed or embarrassed to talk about this. We're going to talk about our breasts. We're going to talk about breast cancer. And that spread to other diseases and, and certainly uh, across the entire spectrum of, of cancer. And so I really thank the women's, the breast cancer movement back in the, you know, in the 80s when that got started and uh, this pink army evolved and changed us all. Any other back there? Yes, good idea. Stand up. Doug, you want to <laughs> so obviously it's critical. I mean, the population that we're trying to serve, as you mentioned, is 60% of them are over 60 years old. Um, I think what we're seeing, especially as it relates to social media, is that it's their grown kids 
who are really becoming the, the advocates. So if we track all of our calls to our navigation center, it's primarily, or, or a large percentage of them, are adult children who are calling on behalf of their parents who, for whatever reason, um, either uh, aren't willing or, or interested in being as aggressive in terms of what they need to do to uh, hopefully survive their, 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 their cancer experience. Um, but it's a tough population, especially as it relates to you know, sort of social media and, and, and how you target and, and reach that population. And I think what we're seeing internationally is as populations are developing around the world and surviving communicable disease, great news, bad news is they're gonna live long enough to ultimately uh, uh, endure uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, respiratory illness as well. So um, it's, a tough, it's a tough population for us uh, uh, to reach, but we've been targeting sort of the, the younger demographic that, that has family members with the disease. Just, you know, as you guys look around the world, obviously, there are different degrees of, of digital infiltration, right? So, so as much as you guys are going fast forward to the social media space, are you guys still leaning fairly heavily on the analog side to get the message out? Absolutely. I mean, we launched a massive campaign yesterday in Mexico, um, uh, a share your story campaign to reduce the stigma. We've proven now through our work in South Africa that if you just train survivors how to share their story publicly, just that process alone, whether it's with the media or in their community, will drive more and more people to go get screened. Mm -hmm. Because historically people have said, I don't want to know if I have cancer. Uh, because someone down the street found out and, and, and there was nothing they could do. So if you tell that survivor story, you can reduce the stigma. And we're doing that through mass media and, and other advertising campaigns that are offline as well. Yeah, and then you get another, I mean, you take another uh, a hero. From, for example, we'll talk about Mexico. With it. We have a, a great partner of ours, Lorena Rojas, who's a, a Mexican soap opera star. Huge Twitter following, breast cancer survivor, loves to talk about her disease. He put her out. So in a, in a country like that where a, a woman in Mexico would never talk about that, they're seeing this beautiful lady that they watch on the soaps every day out there talking about it and tweeting about it and, you know, talking about Livestrong. It makes all the difference in the world when they're, when they're sitting there wondering whether or not they go tell their neighbor or they tell their school or they tell their workplace. All right. Well, uh, we've actually run out of time. I want to thank both of you, Lance Armstrong and Doug Ullman. Yep. Uh, really interesting. And thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.